Milano. E, um, il prossimo relatore è di nuovo uh, il dottor Robson, eh, che questa volta ci parlerà di distocia eh, del secondo stadio del travaglio, taglio cesareo o parto operativo vaginale, come ridurre il rischio di danno materno e neonatale. Uh, thank you Monica, and uh, I'll take this off. And uh, as I was saying, uh, there was a very good lecture by Monica on uh, operative vaginal delivery today. So I think it would be a very interesting debate and discussion afterwards, and one uh, very appropriate to finish off the day if we uh, actually get to the end of the day. Anyway, um, let's see if I can contribute to this. Unders this is a very important uh, um, slide to me. Understanding etiology is the basis of management of any conditions. Um, I, I didn't ever really particularly want to be a pathology, but pathologist, but when I did pathology, they really ingrained this into me. Now, Together with the etiology, there has to be a purpose. So when you're actually looking at any condition, there's a reason why you're looking at it. Most people don't look at something for no reason. But if you are going to look at it, whatever it is, you need a definition, you need a diagnosis, you need an incidence, you need a treatment and, um, or various treatments, and you need to look what happens afterwards, any complications. So if we apply this to dystocia, purpose of looking at dystocia, well, I think we all agree that dystocia is an issue. But once we start talking about it and define it, then it becomes really difficult. Defining it is one thing, upon which diagnosis depends, upon which the incidence depends, upon which any treatment depends, and um, then the complications of either the condition itself or the treatment. So you can see that if you haven't got a definition and you're not talking about the same thing, methodologically speaking at least, you, you have a problem. And that's where we are with dystocia. But let's see where we go. There is no helpful working definition or classification in my view of dystocia. Failure to progress, failure to advance, a rest, then add in a certain number of hours. Um, you can then talk about dystocia as the whole labor. And, and this is very important to understand, is that when you talk about dystocia, some people measure dystocia according to no progress for two hours, three hours. They say there's no progress, they give oxytocin, it's a dystocic labor, they give oxytocin and the woman has a normal delivery two hours later, you know, an overall labor five hours, six hours. Is that a dystocic labor? I'm not sure really it is. A dystocic labor is probably a, 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 a more complete uh, analysis or, or discussion or even definition is the whole labor itself, and that's the one that I would prefer. But we have got a terminology problem in, in, in how we talk about it, and especially amongst ourselves as professionals. As I said, the simplest definition, an abnormal or prolonged labor and a certain number of hours. Let's not get into the detail about this, but, you know, 12, 24, 36, 48, whatever. We've got, all got our own definitions. A slow or difficult labor or delivery, um, that adds in a bit of subjective criteria in the sense that it could be not necessarily fitting with a certain number of hours, but it wasn't straightforward. Um, or you could have a labor resulting in a cesarean section where there is no suspected fetal distress. And that would be the ultimate dystocic labor where at whatever time you decided, and again, let's not get into the detail, but it ended up with delivery by cesarean section. That's an ultimate difficult labor, if you like, because it didn't work, uh, whatever else happened. And therefore, when if you come down to simple definitions, you could argue that Caesarean section in labor, which is the ultimate uh, thing for dystocia, includes one of these three things. There's only three reasons that you can section labor if you really take a high level. Remember this simplification, <laughs> clarity of thought. Fetal reason, no oxytocin, okay? Whatever the fetal reason is. Let's not get bothered about that. The obstetrician made the decision, pH or, or CTG or STAN event or whatever. And then you've got dystocia, no treatment with oxytocin, 
and dystocia after treatment with oxytocin. Yeah, there may be the odd black fox in there. There may be a, the odd cord prolapse. There may be something like this. Well, even that would go into fetal, fetal reason uh, uh, oxytocin, but maybe the odd, uh, the odd uh, um, face presentation or otherwise. But fundamentally, those are the uh, uh, reasons, and that may be a, a, a way to define dystocia. And it's very useful because you've got an objective criteria there, oxytocin. Or... You could use a diagnosis of dystocia, as many people do, is when somebody comes in in labor and you have a clinical event where we have done something and we've done it because there's no progress. I've already talked about cesarean, but people start to include artificial rupture of membranes and oxytocin in it. So the whole thing becomes very confusing. Now, what has this got to do with the second stage? Well, bear with me and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Because... Inherently, all of us need a philosophy or should have a philosophy on labor. Um, and that's very, very important, I think. Now, I've declared my philosophy on labor very, very often. And for want of repeating it again, I think efficient uterine action is the key to normality, both in the first stage and the second stage. And what I'm leading up to is that you can't talk about the second stage without talking about the first stage. And I think that there are very good reasons for that. And it really amazes me how people can pick out and talk about doing trials in the second stage of labor where they've got all kinds of different components of the first stage. The uterus is a muscle, it gets tired. And if a muscle has had a long time uh, working, it surely won't work as well as a muscle that's at a shorter time. So if you're going to look at the second stage, you've got to look at the first stage as well. First stage, we measure dystocia, ultimately in cervical dilatation. In the second stage, it's descent and rotation. And I think that's very important to remember. Some people would argue they use descent and, uh, in the first stage. But as far as I know, very few people actually react to that in terms of uh, treatment. So let's put some uh, pictures really here. This is what I mean by efficient uterine action. Just very, very simple overview. It's actually saying, and don't get excited about one more than one centimeter an hour. It just means that it's to the left of that 45 uh, degree line, which isn't an action line or anything. That's efficient uterine action, and that is inefficient uterine action. Which one would you rather examine to do a forceps or vaginal operative delivery in? Maybe I put it a different way. Which one do you think the decision would be easier to make what to do? And I have shown that in a yellow pargram and it's a nullet, but progression of labor and efficient uterine action in the context of what's normal and abnormal really has to be also taken in the concept of whether it's a nullip, a multip with no scar, a multip with a scar, and whether it's spontaneous or induced labor. Whatever our definition of efficient uterine action, and I've given you mine, um, that's what uh, should be considered in terms of making a uh, decision. Now last year, and I'm not going to go through this again, we introduced this classification overall for cesarean and labor, and the advantages of dividing into fetal and dystocia and inefficient uterine and inefficient uh, uterine action. But today we're going to look more closely at the second uh, stage of labor. And when you, on the back of thinking about what we talked up to now, you define the second stage of labor, the philosophy of efficient uterine and action and labor is really to suggest that my bias is towards labor as a dynamic process rather than a static process. So I kind of think of this, is she an anat anatomically fully or physiologically fully? So anatomically fully, you may not feel any cervix, but the labor has been so long that she's neither ready to push or indeed will not necessarily be able to push because it's still very high and the uterus is very tired. While physiologically fully, maybe the opposite. You have a multip who is maybe eight centimeters and feels like pushing. You know as well as I do that they are physiologically fully. Now, to try and explain this to somebody who isn't interested in labor is very difficult because people don't actually uh, understand the difference. But they are very, very different, although in 
in anatomical terms, they are reversely associated with what we regard as full dilatation. And I think we should remember that. So when you get to second stage, when you diagnose second stage of labor, remember whether anatomically or physiologically fully. Now, a little bit more about labor, and to really, again, simplify it, and again, this will probably blow your mind in terms of <laughs> trying to understand what I'm saying. I would put to you that there are only two examinations that are important in the first stage of labor. There's an examination of one to three centimeters, which is the diagnosis of labor, and there's an examination four to nine centimeters. That actually, these are the two decision points of of uh, dystocia in the first stage uh, uh, of, of, of labor. And I think anything in between, we get so tied up about two centimeters to three centimeters or three centimeters to four centimeters. And these examinations could easily be marked as examination A and examination B. Now, I haven't got any evidence to prove this. All I can contribute to the discussion is that I go through about 8,000 partograms a year and have done for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, at the National Maternity Hospital, which delivers 10,000 deliveries. That's a lot of partograms that you go through. And just recording the lines and seeing it again and again, it leaves a lasting impression. Now, examination C is when you get to 10 centimeters, and that's full dilatation. And that can be divided up into phase one and phase two, as we know, high transverse sagittal suture and low anterior posterior sagittal suture. So it's very important when you actually get to the second stage of labor to think conceptually of, of that as well. And if you take this philosophy of efficient uterine action to the full extent, you come out with this statement, which is taken from O'Driscoll in, uh, in uh, uh, Active Management of Labor, about transverse arrest. You've all heard transverse arrest. You probably have an Italian name for it. But in the Lipris woman, a rest in the transverse diameter of the pelvis is not, as the term may apply, the result of physical obstruction, but rather the expression of inadequate driving force. OT position is much more common, I would argue, in a labor, for whatever reason, has had poor progress. Now, with multip, it's very, very different. And a multip that arrests in the second stage of labor, on the basis of incidence on its own, is an extremely unusual situation and should be regarded more as an obstruction rather than uh, 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 um, the result of the delay. So important decisions at full dilatations. You, we need an understanding of dystocia, and we need to start having this debate. By all means, argue with each other, discuss it, but to try and get to a position where we're all talking about the same thing. At full dilatation, you must determine whether you're intervening because of a dystocic reason or a fetal reason. This is absolutely paramount because everything you do in a chain of events depends on that. And too many times, if you ask people why they're doing it, why they did, they certainly hasn't, haven't written in the notes, they're not clear, but it's very, very important because there are obviously different lines of, of, of treatment and, and, and management. Fetal monitoring, well, uh, you can argue for intermittent Pinard Doppler if everything has been normal up to that stage. Um, but if you've got poor progress, you will have to, depending on whether it's a nullip or multip, consider something like oxytocin. And I th certainly think then you should uh, start continuous electronic monitoring. But where does fetal blood sampling? Well, many of you don't use fetal blood sampling. I can explain to you where it fits in for us. If somebody has got to the second stage of labor and there is an abnormal trace, but is in the first phase of the second stage, I, with an with a abnormal fetal heart, don't want to start doing a delivery where I don't know what the condition of the baby is. So if I examine and I know by criteria I'll come to that I will be able to deliver, give or take 99.99%, then fine, I'll go ahead. But if I'm at all unsure whether I can deliver and there's abnormal trace, I would like to know the fetal condition before I embark because subsequent actions will uh, uh, depend on that. What I'm really saying is, if it's in the first phase of the second stage, w I would treat that as a continuation of the first stage of labor. 
Important decisions, abdominal examination, too often this is left out. And to me at least, if I'm examining or coming to do a delivery and I can feel two fists palpable or one fifth palpable, I personally don't go any further. And I certainly wouldn't write down that it was one fifth palpable and say that I'm going to do a vaginal operative delivery. I think that's really crucial. A lot of people concentrate on the fetal examination. Presentation obviously is very important. Station to an extent, I think, is, is um, very variable in how people record plus one, plus two. They're only, or plus three, or, or, or minus one. Or minus. There are two kinds of babies in the second stage, those that can be delivered safely and those they can't. Very, very binary, as you would expect from <laughs> uh, me. And position, to a certain extent, whether it's OA or OP, is less important to me, more important where the baby's head is, and that's uh, uh, absolutely crucial, and obviously the abdominal examination. Analgesia is very important, and again, if you're going to do a delivery uh, uh, vag uh, vaginally, operatively, you have to make sure you've got adequate analgesia. A lot of people feel it's inappropriate to give epidural or even indeed spinal in the second stage of labor. I think we've got to uh, make sure that we don't get into a situation halfway through putting the second forceps on that the mother is jumping off the bed. The woman who is panicking in labor or in a lot of pain and very good reason to panic is uncontrollable and we should never allow that situation. So you've got to make sure you judge. Now, yes, if you're skilled and if you've got a Vontuz and you've got a good at giving pudendal block, as we heard this morning, you can do that. But make sure you've got analgesia, especially if you're doing it for dystocia uh, because there's no reason to hurry and that's why it's so important. As far as organizational delivery room theater, personally, I think that very few should be done in the delivery room. I think it's unnecessary, and I think if you've got uh, uh, experienced people or skilled people, I think is more appropriate rather than junior or senior. Some people are uh, more skilled and less skilled than others. Um, I think most of them can be done in the, um, I I and should be done uh, wherever it's convenient uh, in the, in the labor ward. But look, I, I, I don't think there's any strong criteria about that. I think you've got to decide what to do, but I certainly think you should uh, audit it. And in certain situations, if you're going up to theater every time to do vaginal operative delivery, that causes organizational issues as, as well. And this just is a, a paper from the British Journal, a lot of good papers written by Ian McKenzie um, um, supporting uh, uh, that view. And indeed, if there is a baby that's already hypoxic, you know, that delay could cause uh, problems. I want to be quite clear that I've been talking about single cephalic pregnancies, breach and multiple pregnancy. Let's just leave that because they're a completely different debate and shouldn't even be mentioned really in the same uh, presentation. So they're completely different. And as we know, premature labor per se doesn't really uh, uh, cause a problem. Use of ultrasound, some people are very good at it. I've got no problems with it. I don't find it useful to me because I think that uh, the physiology, physiological approach and the philosophy of labor, I, I don't think it's, uh, it, it will be that use. It's just like a bit like doing ERPCs and doing it according to the ultrasound. I, I, maybe it's just me, but I, I like feeling things and, and uh, uh, using my hands to decide whether it will come or not. I would be hard pushed to do one where I'm told by the ultrasound that I can do it and, and, uh, and vice versa as well. Uh, I, I depend on my hands. But look, I am saying if, if you use it and it's helpful, so be it. Um, treatment. Um, these are the causes and these are the type of women. So there's inefficient uterine action, persistent malposition, cephalopelvic disproportion in the liparous women, and obstructed labor and obstructed labor in multips and no scar, uh, multips with scar. In nilipris women, even if they've got to full dilatation, even if they've got there very quickly, inefficient uterine action is the most common cause. And we would, as I will come to in a minute, treat that with oxytocin first. Multiprits with no scar that get to fully and it doesn't come down, that is an obstructed, la obstructed labor. That is dangerous. It, it should be very, very rare. And we would never, ever, 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 ever put up oxytocin in a multiprous woman at, uh, at fully. Now that will be completely different to a lot of other people, but remember, we've got an efficient first stage. We have, we have taken that out completely off the, out of the equation. Other people have to struggle when it gets slowly up to fully 
is this inefficient uterine action in a multip, or is it an obstructed labor? Part of the purpose of having a philosophy on labor is not only a safe mother and baby, which is obviously uh, paramount, but safe and easy decision making for the midwife and for the doctor at the time. And that's one of the things that I think is becoming more and more important uh, at the moment. So oxytocin, and I'm not gonna go into the dose or whatever, but it will be used in nilipris women, but not in multipris women at fully. Vaginal upper delivery, fundal presta, you use fundal pressure here in chrysalis, I have no experience on that. But vaginal upper delivery or cesarean section, try and set up the rest of the labor so that decision is made as, as easy as possible. I just wanted to say something about delivery at full dilatation, or indeed delivery of cesarean section when the head is well down in any situation. Um, there are very, very poor diagrams, I think, generally in our obstetric books. And if anybody sees uh, a, a good one, I always deliver with my left hand. I stand on the right of the bed and always deliver with my left hand. And it's a bit like we're talking about shoulder dystocia today. I feel I get better access down on the head that way rather than my hand coming in from the side. Does everybody understand what I mean? And when babies need to be got out and sometimes causes a bit of panic or distress to the operator, never mind the baby or the mother and father, it's always usually, in my opinion, about getting access. And that hand going down there is really just to clear the vacuum and just take your time, take your time, look at the clock, take your time, and eventually the vacuum will actually go. I think one of the most dangerous things is to get a poor midwife or whoever else is standing there, theatre nurse, to push from below. Um, I think it's very difficult to do and I really worry about A, what um, uh, problems could be caused, or indeed, as Sergio would say, I don't know where Sergio is, who's actually, what would the uh, judge, what was the guy you called in Italy? The, uh, the uh, judge, or what, not the judge, the um, exam, sorry? Okay, the judica. What you would say, whose who's responsibility it is? Is it the gynecologist or is it the person that was pushing up from below? The, well, it's certainly <laughs> the neonatologist. Yeah. Anyway, healthy and satisfied mother and baby, physical and emotional. And actually, when you do do um, uh, deliveries there, whether it's cesarean section or, full, or operative delivery, we are seeing more and more of these women for explanations, for discussions afterwards, about six to uh, 12 weeks after, to go through the procedure. How can we prove maternal and neonatal outcome? Standardized perinatal, perinatal audit. Now, I put this up, and I really want to ask your questions. I've only got two slides left, so, do, so don't worry. I said about keeping simplicity and clarity. And you're looking at this and thinking, well, he's really gone the other direction now. This is the most complicated thing I've ever seen, okay? And I'm not gonna make any apologies for this. I would argue it's, it's not simple in the sense there's a lot of numbers there, but it's clarity of thought. And I'll just explain it to you. This is group one. This is years. These are the denominators, we've taken the 2014, and you've got ARM, oxytocin, epidural, electronic monitoring, fetal blood sampling, you can see them yourself going down there, okay? And the, new, the denominator is the total number of women in group one, and the numerator is whatever the incidence of that is. Now, at first off, it looks very complicated, but I want you to notice two things. The consistency of the numbers, I want you to look at any aspect of labor, if you're going to look at vaginal upper delivery rate, if you're going to look at cesarean section rate at fully, you look at one, but then you want to or need to look at another one. So if we just take the overall section rate in group one was seven to eight percent, and the cesarean section at uh, V uh, 10 centimeters was 1.6 of the total denominator, okay? So 1.6 is part of 8.4. And then you can go straight to the vaginal upper delivery, just like Jan Paolo was saying. And I would argue this is simple. To me, it's very, very simple in the sense that you just have to start looking at it and you get the numbers. Give it another 10 seconds, but do you find, how many people actually find it complicated? You don't find it complicated. 
It is very, very simple. Now, just think if you had those figures for your own unit, and it's just a simpli simplicity and clarity of thought, and you can look at all of those things. Now, that is group one, and just look here. 1.6 is there in section rate in, uh, fully at full dilatation in group one. In group two, 2.2%. In group three, which is spontaneous multiples, 0.3%, 0.1%. And in group four, 0.1, 0.5, it says right. So there's clear differences. And these are, you know, 2,000 in each year. So you add them up, I'm sure it will be uh, significant. But you need to look at your oxytocin rates. You need to look at everything. And the point about it all is, is we're here today to kind of share different views on how to manage. And I think that whatever our view is about labor, you need a philosophy of labor, and you need to say, this is how we do it, this is consistently what we do, whatever it is. But wouldn't it be nice to share tables like this and to learn from each other so that, you know, processes may vary, we should embrace different ways of doing things, but look at things in a standard way. Thank you very much.